All right, we're on. So welcome everyone uh, to the FreeBSD office hours uh, where Warner and I will be giving an update on the FreeBSD project's transition to Git, where we are and what our next steps are. Uh, Warner. Uh, thanks, Ed. Let me, let me start our presentation. Uh, okay. So is that coming coming through? Yeah, that should be on the stream. Okay, so I'm, Google has a new feature of presenting a tab and I'm using that today, so. Um, anyway, uh, Ed and I have been leading the Git transition group all year and we're ready to start the transition of the project um, to different things. Um, the project started out using CVS uh, in the um, 90s. And uh, transitioned to using CVS and Perforce as a way of uh, making sure that the current tree was always buildable and stable enough to use. Uh, and a lot of the problems with CVS were becoming uh, apparent when we made this. Uh, Peter Wim switched us over to Subversion in 2008 mostly to get atomic commits, but also to help us uh, make it easier to have uh, project-wide visible branches in Subversion uh, for large in-flight projects that were going on, such as porting to new architectures and so forth. Um, it took us about four years to get fully switched over to Subversion. Docs and ports came in 20, um, 2012. And for several years now, we've had a GitHub mirror uh, that we've published the um, results of a subversion to Git conversion. Last year, um, as part of uh, ongoing efforts uh, to evaluate tooling, the core team uh, issued a developer survey and finally decided that there was um, strong support for a switch to Git, although there were some people that uh, were uneasy or less happy with uh, that prospect. But by and large, the, uh, the core team decided that the, uh, that the industry had moved on from Subversion to Git. When we had done the conversion to Subversion in 2008, it was the most popular uh, version control system at the time, uh, and its popularity has waned since then. So. Um, when we did the conversion from the CVS repository to uh, Subversion, we lost a little bit of metadata information. For example, referring to different versions in MSC commits. Um, the later Git conversion that we did was with a uh, earlier version of the conversion tools and FreeBSD's large repository. Um, uh, provided several opportunities for the conversion tool to go awry. And um, we've discovered over time that the uh, conversion is actually uh, has poor um, fidelity for vendor branches and some metadata, and it treated some MFCs in a way that was problematic. And so uh, the Git conversion group decided to do a new conversion one that was uh, reproducible, one that had good fidelity, and so that the issues that uh, came up with the poor fidelity of the conversion wouldn't uh, get in our way operationally going forward. We traded a one time a uh, little bit of pain for uh, having uh, the project be able to not have that pain every time we need to do a vendor import or uh, split things out of the repository or things like that. Um, so. Um, we have a GitHub repo um, that, or sorry, we have a GitHub, um, yeah, we have a GitHub repo for the conversion tools that we used. You can uh, go there, and we have a number of articles um, there about the uh, hashes changing, um, and the new uh, repos are on the URL on the screen. It's cgit beta now. Uh, eventually, it will be git.freebsd.org once the conversion is complete. Um, there are a couple of tasks remaining um, that we're hoping to get done before the source conversion. 
Um, we need to have commit hooks to ensure that people don't accidentally push uh, large repositories. We don't want, for example, all of LLVM's history to wind up in the FreeBSD repository accidentally. We need to complete the documentation that's been started. Uh, the basics are all documented, um, but some of the advanced topics, uh, the, uh, particularly advanced topics that developers and system integrators need, um, are still in progress. Uh, and finally, we need to um, uh, engage the community uh, with uh, these details. So the schedule for the doc conversion. Um, we'll be starting it this weekend. Uh, and since a number of people are involved in a number of different time zones, um, the worst case scenario that we gamed out would be that it'd be done by the 8th. Uh, if you start using the CGIT beta uh, repo now uh, for your doc needs uh, and pulling the information from that, that will uh, work through the transition. Um, we're also planning two weeks later to do the source conversion. We decided to do the doc conversion first because it was the simplest of our repositories uh, and wanted to ensure that uh, any problems with that uh, we could deal with before we did the source conversion. Uh, problems to the doc repo generally uh, have a smaller impact than the source repo. So we thought that would be the best uh, candidate for a first conversion. Um, the ports tree will be converting uh, probably in March. Um, they have a number of unique challenges to manage uh, ports that are um, different than the source tree and gets um, fit with uh, the type of files that are in the ports tree is different than the source tree. So they're going to take a little bit of time to cut over. The reason I have March up here is they want to cut over just before a quarterly branch. Um, they don't want to do any um, uh, publishing of uh, their commits to multiple branches. Um, and so that left December or March as the two uh, cutover points. And rather than rush into it, they're going to um, do the cutover in March and uh, learn from the source uh, cutover experience as well. So subversion consumers. Um, we will continue to have this publish the subversion repository, um, but they'll be uh, basically in read-only mode. Developers won't interact with them directly, and we'll be publishing the currently supported branches, stable 11 and stable 12. Um, developers will commit their changes to Git, and then we'll publish them, mirror them out of Git back into subversion for uh, consumers of FreeBSD. Uh, we're doing this because uh, there are a lot of, we heard from the, the user community that there are a lot of people with subversion tooling that will take a little while to convert, and they wanted a migration path. So we are going to do that through the end of stable 12, um, currently slated for June 2024. Uh, we're not going to be publishing stable 13 in subversion. Uh, for, the, for the major release upgrade, you're going to need to uh, cut over. Um, <clears throat> so if you're currently using the uh, GitHub subversion, um, sorry, if you're currently using the GitHub uh, repo, uh, Git repo, um, we've had to change hashes to fix a lot of the metadata issues that were in that repository. And we have a couple of articles here on um, how to rebase forward. Um, these will be expanded and will wind up in the FreeBSD uh, handbook. Uh, in the near future. Um, and this last slide gives a number of um, links. Uh, the first one's to the current um, subversion primer. Um, we'll have something similar for uh, Git. Um, I have a FreeBSD Git docs uh, repository on GitHub at the moment. It's serving as a basically a landing zone for any in-progress documentation. The docs People are converting from uh, doc tree to uh, ASCII doc uh, for the conversion. And I didn't want to write the docs and then have to rewrite them. Um, so I've written them in Markdown, which is a subset of ASCII doc. For, so after they've done their conversion, we can just 
roll that in. Um, and I've also included um, the sister project that we have, uh, LLVM um, is recently moved um, all their stuff to GitHub. And this is a link to their experience, which we consulted when we were doing things. Um, so that's the end of the uh, presentation that I have uh, today. Um, so at this point, I think we were going to open it up for questions uh, from the audience. Um, so how are we doing, Ed? Yeah, I think uh, I don't see any questions here yet from um, the, the IRC channel. Um, I think there's a few uh, frequently asked questions that we've had in the past that we can we can talk about if um, uh, if if we don't have any questions coming in. Um, I think some of the um, um, uh, some of the biggest um, concerns, I guess, that have been raised um, in the past when we were talking about um, uh, Git, specifically in the context of the FreeBSD community. Um, are around hashes versus uh, version numbers um, and their, the impact of, of that on, specifically on our tooling and our uh, the way we do things. Um, right. And how, how have we solved that problem? So let's, let's start there. We'll, we'll just yeah. get, knock these down as, as they come up. So, um, so Ed, how are we gonna solve that problem? How do we get some sequential conversion uh, or some sequential commit number um, so people know whether or not they have fixes uh, in a form that's more foreign, uh, sorry, more familiar to them rather than the foreign uh, hashes that Git has. Um, yeah, and, there. And, and so I think the, the answer to that is that um, in some time, the, the answer really is that when someone is asking about revision numbers, there's really some reason underlying reason that they want to know what a, you know what revision a change was made in or what revision they have um, the, the number itself is not particularly interesting it's it's to be it's to answer a question about you know do I have a change or not or that sort of thing um, or was the bug introduced before or after what I have um, and right. so I, I think the the short answer is that the in the in the overall sort of git world and community the expectation is that most of the time you have um uh, an online connection and you can answer that by um querying the repository directly but specifically in the context of freebsd um we have a, a proxy for the revision number already uh included in what we print in um uh the uname so if you run uname um on a freebsd system built from git it will report the um, the commit count. Um, and so basically it generates that at build time. It queries uh, all of the commits from the root um, to the to the head on the branch of, of interest. Um, so you can you can use that. Um, so if you're running FreeBSD 12 or you're running FreeBSD head, um, that number in uname can be used as mm -hmm. Um, a proxy for is this later or earlier than a bug fix or the introduction of a bug? Okay. Um, we could subsequently build some um, some tooling uh, that doesn't exist today um, to report those, um, you know, to, to provide a web front end or something so that um, to be able to map back and forth between them. Yeah, other other projects present that as just kind of an FYI. Um, between when you build from their repository between tags as well. So it's not, it, it's also something that is used in the wider community, although generally people, um, you know, do have gotten used to using hashes in the, you know, wider open source community. So long term, I suspect that people will just naturally migrate to, to using that information. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things that comes up a lot is um, the dollar FreeBSD dollar tag? Yeah. What's what's the story with that in um, Git, and what uh, what should users expect there? So uh, Git natively doesn't um, do anything with dollar ID or dollar uh, FreeBSD. Um, in the FreeBSD world, the dollar FreeBSD tag is a project specific implementation of dollar ID. 
which Subversion or CVS um, replaces the it 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 places the the revision um, into the source file. Um, and generally speaking, I think the the Git worldview is um, that uh, your file shouldn't um, change as a result of your version control system. So Git's Git's native take is dollar FreeBSD doesn't update, um, and most of the FreeBSD tooling. Um, uh, doesn't care about the dollar FreeBSD um, in any case. Uh, there, you know, there were some questions raised about uh, some of the um, tools that merge uh, file, Etsy files on update and things like that, and and all of those work um, uh, without it. Um, so, so, so merge master and Etsy update are fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it has become more of a human readable. Queue, uh, clue mm -hmm. people that whether or not you have a particular change, um, and and there are scripts out there. Um, we'll probably include one in the FreeBSD tree that l lets you find out what version a file uh, came from. Um, there are ways to compute a uh, delta between the file you have and different versions in the Git tree, and you can find the one with the smallest uh, score. As far as you know, amount of change, and assume that things were derived from that. Um, Git is much better about inferring where things came from than prior source code uh, mm -hmm. systems as well. So um, we're thinking, you know, just to amplify, we're thinking that we won't need, uh, you know, we won't need that, and downstream projects won't need that as much. Um, you know, we introduced dollar FreeBSD. Uh, back in the days when we still had things like CTM for people that were disconnected um, from the repository entirely, where we would um, every day batch up changes and send them out via email uh, to people who might be at the other end of a UCP link or some, you know, something before the highly connected uh, internet that we have today. And, and yeah. since things are more connected, um, uh, as with the answer for the uh, revision ID. Um, you know, going back to the repository um, is not a big deal. Uh, unlike Subversion, Git always mirrors the repository. Um, so you'll always have a copy locally uh, to, to look at. You won't have to say, oh, gee, I'm dead in the water. My network's not working. What's going on? Um, you know, you, I, can't, I can't get to the internet to find the answer. Well, you can find the answer in your local repository about when, you know, what version you have and, you know, when different changes happen and whether or not you have that change and even you can roll back to that. So um, that ability to roll backwards and forwards even without network connectivity um, will also be helpful if you find yourself in an unfortunate situation where you've done a source upgrade and something's gone horribly wrong and you need to take a step back or maybe bisect and, and not have good connectivity and you don't have a subversion mirror set up. Yeah, and and one of the arguments for dollar free BSD has always been that um, if some other project copies one of our files, um, and we can later on figure out where it came from. Um, but I think you know the the issue with that is that um, typically when that happens, that other project goes on to make a whole bunch of changes um, and and whatnot. Anyway, if if we're looking at a file that has migrated elsewhere and then come, you know, we have some interest in bringing it back to FreeBSD. Um, there's a whole bunch of work that needs to be done to kind of understand how it changed from uh, from when it, it left FreeBSD anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it, so, some some operations like that maybe are, are slightly, um, slightly more awkward, but I think uh, really uh, the fact that um, that we can the, the model is is um, is based largely on ubiquitous connectivity, um, having a, lo a local copy of the repository. Um, when you want to ask questions about what's new or what's older, um, where did something go, uh, being able to query something, query query a repository to ask answer that question, I think is is um, it's a very different context today than it was fifteen or ten years ago. Yeah, that is true. That is true. So this is one of the ways that the project is um, updating its workflows and stuff. One of the motivators for switching to Git was that um, it provided a larger number of tools 
um, to improve our workflow, to do better continuous integration, to do better testing, to um, do better merging from other projects. Um, I, the, if I've forgotten something in this quick list, I mean, the, the list is so long, I have trouble keeping it all in my head. Um, and a lot of those things, yeah, were kind of available with Subversion um, because Subversion used to be so popular. So the older tools tend to support it, you know, in kind of a legacy mode. And newer tools sometimes just didn't bother doing that at all, which limited our ability to um, try to innovate our process and to try to stay modern with our process. Um, we've got a lot of things and how we do things that are rooted in the 90s, frankly, uh, that need to update. I mean, we've done some things. I'm not saying, you know, it's all gloom and doom here. But, um, you know, we were finding that subversion was coming up consistently as one of the, the, the issues, whether we wanted to try a new bug tracking system, we wanted to do a new review system, those sorts of things. Subversion was really limiting us. And now we, are, we have some freedom to uh, experiment a little bit more. Um, there's a number of, nobody mirrors Subversion for people, but you know, there's at least seven different websites of various sizes that will mirror your Subversion, or sorry, your Git repository uh, for you uh, from anywhere from a small fee to no fee, you know, GitHub and GitLab and um, uh, SourceForge and a few others that provide, you know, premium hosted services. Um, and, and so that, you know, Git has a much richer ecosystem as well. So, you know, we'll be able to use those different tools in whatever way that, um, you know, fits with the project's uh, needs and cultures and, and um, desire, uh, much like other open source projects are. You know, there's several that um, are using GitHub, several that are using GitLab. Uh, some are rolling their own, some are publishing to everywhere. Um, it just depends on the uh, project and what the project's needs are, what subset of these things they do, and whether they host their own or have something um, that's in the cloud. Um, you know, that's also decisions that we can make now that we really weren't able to before, before we had to roll our own and we had to do that. Now, the first version of Git we're rolling out, we're rolling our own, but that doesn't preclude us from, you know, having third parties and other people in the future provide uh, either mirroring services or even hosting services if um, we find it's cheaper and better and a, you know, a, a better use of project resources to go that way. Um, yeah, and that's that's a really good point. Um, there was a question just now about. Um, uh, whether we'll be um, continuing to mirror to GitHub, um, and I think the you know there's a there's a short easy answer to that to that question answer to that question and, and it's yes um, the uh, FreeBSD um, uh, you know for for many reasons will remain um, with a, a mirror on GitHub. Um, there's lots of uh, forks and downstream projects that um, are already set up there, um, and we definitely want them to be able to continue uh, interacting with FreeBSD um, there. Right, and, and since we're doing the doc tree first, we'll also be able to, to see what some of the impact is. Um, yeah. Kind of an unknown, we, we, we do anticipate there's, there's some issues. Uh, we're changing the uh, name from master to main, for example, um, largely because that's the new Git uh, default, and we anticipate all the guides in the future will have main in them, and we want to, um, you know, leverage other people's information. You know, it's getting to the point with Subversion, we have to roll our own everything, including docs on how to use it. Um, with Git, we're able to, you know, use other people's docs. Um, and, you know, that change will be part of it, but I don't, we don't know how disruptive that will be. We'll have, um, I posted some answers in email that I'll turn into docs on how uh, current users of the doc tree, maybe you've got some changes in fight that you want to get in, and you have a, a fork off of our uh, um, GitHub repo, uh, there'll be changes or docs on how to move those to the new branch. So then you can um, uh, submit those for uh, the project and then you can track future changes. Um, one of the things we hope to go to in the future but aren't in phase one um, is a pull request model where we can more easily accept pull requests uh, from different places. Um, we have to figure out how to um, manage that um, with um, Fabricator and Bugzilla and 
GitHub pull requests and maybe GitLab pull requests, or you know, how are we, how is a project are we going to manage all of that? And um, just to get the tooling converted over, had enough issues and crazy things come up that um, you know we decided to push those issues off for the future where they can be tackled. Once we're converted to Git, we can tackle those one at a time, and different groups can do different things in parallel, so that we can um, look at these, uh, you know, tooling improvements. So we'll absolutely publish um, to GitHub in the future. We'll have a, you know a, a quick guide for, you know, what did we do? I have these old things. I have these old things off of old branches. How do I make that conversion to the to the new uh, repository that's pushed? Um, we'll probably keep the same names or very similar names on GitHub, uh, but those names might be different than the names we use uh, internally, um, just because the use cases are different and the defaults should be different. Um, we'll see how that works out. Um, you know, this is the first step of a journey, not you know the end thing that we're stuck with forever. So if we make any missteps along the way, we'll. Um, you know, we'll be able to, to go in and correct those. Yeah, I think um, that's um, that's a really good point that kind of our our overall um, uh, approach and intent in this um, first phase of the Git migration uh, is that our workflow that, that is already used in the FreeBSD project um, is basically being transplanted directly um, to a Git model. Uh, and so there are there are some things that if we were starting up a brand new project, uh, you know, that, that uh, and we didn't have people who already understand how to do various things and didn't have some institutional inertia and, and whatnot, we might do completely differently. Um, but uh, our goal here was to keep things um, as much as possible in kind of the existing mental model um, of, of the way that FreeBSD development is done. And we can investigate ways of, uh, you know, we, we can we can try out other things from there once we've migrated and investigate whether they work better or not for us. Um, right, so we have a question in um, about documentation in the IRC channel, which is, uh, um, will the vendor branch stuff be documented? Absolutely. I'm, I'm working on docs right now. Um, the, we've done things. Um, if you go and look at um, our repository, we have thousands, literally, of uh, vendor branches. So um, uh, with, if you count vendor branches and tags and all of this. Um, and so when we did the conversion, we've um, segregated that to a different namespace. Um, and I'll have documentation on how do you get the thing out of the namespace and how do you do the bootstrap process for Git. Um, you know, we'll have a bootstrap process, much like we did when we converted from Subversion or to Subversion from CVS. There'll be a bootstrap process, and there'll be docs on how to do um, the subtree merges. Will be um, primarily what we anticipate people uh, using uh, for this process. So that um, they can, we can track episodically upstream versions. But um, we're also looking in the future to allowing people to have basically FreeBSD forks of different projects um, that are minimal changes to the project um, that we can integrate from uh, Git repository. Um, but all the integration work can happen continuously. Um, or asynchronously to what winds up in FreeBSD um, in the different uh, Git repositories, and we can easily import those, um, and also have uh, you know have it be documented and stylized um, to give people enough freedom to make different decisions for different things, but also be similar enough so that if somebody drifts away from the project and you want to import the way to send mail or less or whatever other project is going on. That you know somebody else can pick up the baton where the other folks left off, um, and not have it be completely foreign and alien and everything done in a different uh, different way. So um, we'll be documenting the the basics that we need to do right away, as well as some of the longer term strategy 
um, that we hope this will unlock. Um, things like LLVM are huge and a big pain to do today, um, although we've got some scripting in place to do that. Um, this should make that even easier and reduce the friction um, that is there for different uh, things going into the tree. Um, and we're, okay, there's three different ways. There are subtree merges, there are submodules, and there are sub repos. I remember right with Git. We're not using submodules because they're a poor fit for the project. I'll just leave it there. Um, the reason they're a poor fit for the project, um, other projects use them, and as part of their build process, they have to pull in the submodules. There's no easy way for users of FreeBSD to know. I guess I'm expanding on a little more than just leaving it there. There's no way for the user of the project to know what all the submodules are, and you have to do it recursively, and there's extra steps. Um, since we're using um, subtree merges um, and subrepos um, in the future, we're not using that initially. Um, we will um, be able to pull that in, but then users of the project um, will have no clue that any of this has happened. They'll need to not need to know it. Um, no clue is maybe a little strong. If you go looking for it, you can find the information um, and you can see where things came from. But as a general user, it's just git pull, git clone. Um, you know, that workflow, you don't have to go, oh, wait, I didn't update my submodule, so now my build didn't work. And, oh, for me, this submodule, this version worked, but that version didn't. We're, we're going to try to avoid all of that um, uh, with our use of um, uh, with our use of Git. Um, most of the projects that we talked to, um, uh, open source projects that were using submodules said, yeah, we're using it. And it was the best we had when we started, and we'd probably make different decisions today. So, um, you know, we took that feedback and said, well, we're going to start out not using them and resist using them. If somebody can make a good case in the future, we might be open to it, but we're not, we don't have any plans today um, for that. Yeah, one of the um, long standing attributes of um, FreeBSD is that, you know, as, as a user of FreeBSD, if you're building from source, you've always been able to do one checkout of one mono repo, and you've, you get the compiler, and you get the kernel, and you get the C library. Um, you know, it's, it's very much um, the source tree is, is batteries included. Everything is, is in one spot, um, you know, and, and we may well have reason to evaluate that um, differently in the future as, um, as other FreeBSD related projects um, like package base come around um, and other, you know, as the context changes, maybe we'll, maybe there'll be an opportunity to look at, at doing things differently, but uh, at, uh, as as with the the kind of overall goal of uh, having a, an incremental change and not just rewriting the entire workflow and, and the uh, the entire approach um, all at once, um, you know we we want to have the same model where you, you you'll do a git clone of FreeBSD and be able to build it exactly the same way and everything is is there. Yeah, uh, one of the areas that has been a frequent request is um, LLVM. It takes probably a quarter of the time for LLVM to load. And in the interim, before we figure out, you know, before package base lands, before we figure out um, all of those details, um, there are ways that you can build, um, install an LLVM port, and then build the FreeBSD tree. Now, there are um, some obscure issues with some ports doing this and some other edge cases that don't affect everybody, but affect enough people that this isn't the default today. Um, but it, that is you know, something that's, that's completely separate from the stuff we're doing now um, that you can do today if you wanted to address um, that problem. Uh, properly chunking things up and maybe having repos become shared with other projects or those sorts of things. Those are the sorts of workflow changes that you know, we'll be able to do in the future. Um, there was a question about why we didn't consider other alternatives to Git. Um, uh, someone had gone off and done uh, Fossil. Um, NetBSD couldn't do Fossil. It, it would not work for them. Also, um, one of the main reasons that was motivating the change was not, is this a source code system that could do the work? It's um, we wanted to tap into a larger ecosystem. 
um, fossil didn't show up, um, mercurial barely showed up um, in the surveys. So um, we decided rather than uh, hemming and hawing and trying to decide over which one is best and, and basically getting bogged down in, 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 in those sorts of arguments, um, the prior core team said, look, you know, Git is really the only alternative. Um, Subversion has way more support than anything else other than Git. And, you know, it's maybe has one tenth the support that Git has today. Um, if we're going to change, we should change for something that's already out there that new people to the project already know or likely know because it's taught in schools. Fossil is not taught in schools. Fossil is not used widely. Um, Fossil is not well maintained. Um, it's got a few features that work well on smaller repositories, but large repositories have problems. The NetBSD folks had reported um, when I was chatting with them that they had a couple of instances where their database would get corrupt and the repository is gone. And we thought that that, um, uh, you know, those are all challenges that could be overcome. Let's just put it that way. But as a project, our focus isn't on overcoming challenges in source code management systems. Our project focus as a project is producing a good OS. And the only reason we're talking source code management today is because Subversion was getting in the way of that in a number of ways. And switching to Fossil, um, you know, it does have a better license. Um, it might be a little bit more uh, interesting. Um, I know that um, SQLite um, uses it, um, but they have a very different uh, model for their releases and for their um, source code. Uh, than we have. So, um, you know, it's, we learned from the experience in 2008, um, where we did have this big, long discussion. And we did actually pick Subversion over Git at the time. And one of the big reasons for that was Subversion worked and Git didn't at the time. You could import the repository, yeah, but then when you started doing things, it was too big and Git fell over. And we had to wait for the Linux kernel to balloon to the side <laughs> of the FreeBSD repository before Git would solve some of these problems. Now, that might be a little uncharitable. But if, if, if you're looking at it from a risk management point of view, um, if things don't work for the, something the size of the Linux kernel repo, then um, you know they get fixed quickly in Git. And our repository is actually smaller than the Linux kernel repository. So, from that perspective, we went from being, you know, it was in 2008, it was a high risk, crazy move that, yeah, we could have made work, but it, there would have been a lot of pain for a couple of years to now where, oh, this is just a mainstream use of Git and, you know, there's not a lot of risk there. So, you know, those were some of the reasons that we didn't open it up to a larger bake off. Um, you know, it wasn't just, you know, can this one technology do that? You know, if, if you want to go with Fossil, for example, you know, does Fossil have continuous integration uh, tools that support it? Does Fossil have mirroring um, sites that support it? Does Fossil have good um, tutorials that you can point people at who, um, you know, don't know the basics yet? Um, uh, are there, is there more than one of these or is it just, you know, just a couple? And whereas with Git, you search for a Git primer, you can, the hard part is finding which one to, to, to read and which ones are good because Git is so, pervasive and used with so many different workflows, you don't know which one matches the workflow that you want to implement, or you might not even know how to ask that question coming new to Git. So that, you know, that there is a lot of material out there, and that is one thing that might stand a little bit against Git, is that it's a very complicated tool and a little bit difficult to use. But the number of, um, you know, number of third-party tools that it unlocks and, um, once you learn how to use it, you can be quite a bit more productive than you can with Subversion or other tools. Um, for me, I've been using Git SVN for a long time because Subversion doesn't support branches. I say that, it sounds very provocative. If I did about all the branches that I do for my development, I would publish 100 branches a year into the main repository. And most of those branches live three days, four days while I Make the, make the changes and test them out locally. None of that really needs to be in the main repository. If my experience is repeated for 100 developers, that becomes very unmanageable and unwieldy. Um, and so, and in most of the cases, the 99% of the cases, the only interesting bit is the end product. The how I got there doesn't add any value. 
the you know fixing style issues or com compile nits or oh I had an off by one there that um, doesn't really aid in the understanding um, or the you know the, that that history just doesn't um, doesn't give much information to others that are looking at this they see the change they see it's five lines they see that it uh, <clears throat> you know iterates over this or that and there's a comment there that explains it that's all that's really valuable there um so I, I know this is turning into a bit of a long answer but that's um the reason why we um you know didn't have the big bake-off there was no you know it wasn't like if we did it wasn't like in 2008 where you know subversion was clearly the main thing but there were other things that were interesting and contenders that um, were vying for people's attention now it's clearly get so um, you know we were we, we made that the, the decision um, as the in the last core team um, that it would be best in the best interest of the project to go with that direction even though um, the one thing that most people bring up is Git's license on um, being GPL. Um, and that might be a good segue. I don't know if we've got other questions in IRC, but that might be a good segue to the frequently asked, well, what about a Git in base? Do you want to talk about GOT for a couple of minutes, Ed? You've been more focused on that than I have. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, it's true that Git is GPL um, licensed and uh, for... Um, the vast majority of use cases that doesn't really matter. Um, you know, it's it's easy enough, um, and for most people, it's um, it's acceptable um, to just package install uh, Git or build the port um, and uh, and go on. Um, but uh, GPL, um, we as as the FreeBSD project, we we um, uh, have definitely. Um, uh, have a goal of having a, an entirely permissively licensed um, uh, base system and don't want to head in the the opposite direction so um, for that and other reasons um, you know it's we're not going to import uh, get into the base system um, there are a number of permissively licensed uh, Git alikes or Git compatible tools um, that are out there uh, at various stages of, of um, completion and in, implemented in, in various languages. Um, as far as the base system is concerned, uh, OpenBSD's Game of Trees got is uh, the most viable contender at, at this point. Um, you know, it's still under active uh, development and there's still lots to be done, but there is a free BSD port. Um, uh, that uh, that was completed by a, uh, a, a FreeBSD uh, and OpenBSD um, uh, developer um, did the porting effort. Um, so OpenBSD uh, developers um, created uh, Got, and um, uh, it is a it is a Git compatible VCS. So the it, it is it is explicitly not trying to be a BSD license to Git. It is a VCS that um, takes its own uh, approach, follows its own paradigm, um, but is compatible with Git at a repository um, and server level. That's that's kind of the, the underlying intent. Yeah, I, I've heard it described as um, it's um, a CVS with a Git backend. Yeah. That matches OpenBSD's workflow. It's and, more complicated than that and more sophisticated than that, but that's kind of the high level. Um, it has the Git world or the CVS worldview um, with a few additional Git concepts introduced in a compatible way rather than it's command line compatible with Git, which, you know, the Git command line is powerful it's not, but eclectic. Yeah. It's something. Yeah, we'll go with eclectic. Uh, but for um, for a large number of use cases, um, I think GOT actually maps extremely well to what we would like from from a tool. Excuse me, from a tool in the base system. Um, so if if your goal is to download a FreeBSD uh, source tree 
uh, build it and then keep it up to date um, and maybe carry a few local changes. You know, you, you, you changed your kernel config or something like that. But other than that, you're generally just um, tracking FreeBSD and bringing in new changes. Um, got uh, should should be a very nice map to that, um, that sort of workflow. Uh, and so uh, it's available in the FreeBSD ports collection now. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'd encourage people to try it out and, and report their findings. Um, I've done some experimentation with transplanting it into the base system build um, in my, uh, what I call my WIP BSD. Um, uh, so I just I have a, a long running um, Git branch of various experiments um, that I'm trying out, and I've imported uh, got into there and build it as part of the base system, um, and you know it's it's looking um, looking uh, looking pretty good. Um, I have a, a co-op student working um, for the FreeBSD Foundation as well who is uh, experimenting with adding uh, Capsicum to to got um, so that it could be sandboxed using our uh, FreeBSD. Uh, native sandboxing uh, approach. Um, so I think it is, it's not at the point yet where we can say, yes, it's going in the tree and it is um, It is going to be the the standard um, in-tree up, source code up tree, updating tool. Um, but I think there's a highly like high likelihood that that's, that's what will happen. Yeah, we're, we're hoping that that maturation process can happen in time to get it in for FreeBSD 13.0. Um, and we might have it as um, a technology preview in 13.0 if it's not completely mature. We've, we're still trying to figure out how stable it is and how much of a support load it'll generate for the project versus the value and benefit it'll have from you know being there that people uh, that don't want to use Git can can use. So there was a question on um, IRC, unless unless you had no go ahead. So there was a question on IRC. Oops, come on. I can't drive today. Um, about, I mean, what's the preferred way to submit patches um, with Bugzilla? Um, the project certainly will accept uh, Git format patch, and we can use Git AM or patch or whatever to apply those um, to the project. Uh, we certainly anticipate changes like that. Uh, happening, although plain old diffs and stuff will still be accepted. Um, uh, as I had said in earlier, we'll probably also look at having some kind of pull request model or way that you can submit your branch for CI and testing um, and integration so that we can get rid of some of the friction that we have with Bugzilla. Um, one of the reasons I'm kind of at pains to say, well, you know, this will be the official way is I, I anticipate there'll be several changes in this area. Um, Git format patch is certainly easy to create and generate and submit for Bugzilla. And if that makes it easier for you to submit patches, that's great. Um, we have such a high Bugzilla volume right now, we have trouble keeping up with it. Um, one of the issues with that is um, that it's a mix of, these are changes we'd like to put in um, and Bugzilla really isn't a good code review tool, although you can do code review with it. Um, as well as, you know, I, I do this, 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 and this, and I get this kernel panic, or, or I do this, this, and this, and I'll ask core dumps, where it's just a simple bug report. Um, and, and so it's not, um, uh, you know, there's a bit of an impedance mismatch, and that makes it easy for us to overlook patches. I mean, it's better than NATS that we had before. But one of the things in the future that we're definitely want to do is, you know, what are ways that we can streamline the submission process? What are ways that we can have a submission tool for patches that lets us accept or reject the patch in a timely manner um, and allow the submitter even to fi either to fix it or to get an answer that says, no, we're not going to do this. Um, one of the things we've been a little shy about in the past is, uh, getting those answers out. Um, part of it's Bugzilla makes it hard, you know, for me to spend a few minutes um, looking for things that I could meaningfully comment on. Um, and with other better tooling, we may be able to, you know, make more efficient use of our people's time um, so that the, we can get those answers out. Um, you know, as a project, we know we have a problem accepting patches. Um, Sometimes 
you know, goes in and it's great. Other times they languish for years and we're hoping that there's more that go in than languish, but we know that those hopes aren't always realized um, with the tooling and workflow we have today. And that's, again, one of the motivators is we want to have a more optimized workflow. We want to have several workflows, maybe under, a, I, I hate to say it like this, but under a unified umbrella, you know, all these tools use Git and you can pick which one is best suited for, um, you know, your workflow and developers can easily ingest these because there's not a conversion process or anything. It, so the, the, the friction is reduced, but a, a lot of that is still in the future. Um, you know, it's motivating this work today um, and we'll continue to um, accept patches with our current workflow. Um, but, you know, in, in the next year to anticipate additional changes um, as well as we are able to streamline things and leverage a, a wider community base um, than we've been successful at doing in the past. So that's, um, there are several people that submit patches right now to um, <clears throat> to Fabricator. Um, trying to remember what review tool we were using for a second. Um, that, that submit patches to Fabricator that um, uh, uh, would be much easier to integrate if they were submitted as a pull request. Um, it's good they submit them to Fabricator because we can have the discussion, change this, change that, oh, this looks good, whatever, you know, the normal code review uh, things and the people that are submitting them and making the changes. But then sometimes they languish because there's not a committer that's dedicated to committing that. And it's not super visible which one of these external things are, are kind of in a state um, to do that. And the different pull request tools, um, whether it's GitHub or Garrett or some other, uh, one of the dozen other tools that do this, um, allow for things like that, allow for voting. So you can look at things that have a lot of votes. So we should look at this. Um, or that allow for tagging. Yeah, I've, you know, I'm not an expert in USB, but this looks fine to me. Let's, you know, get it past the first hurdle. Everything except for the USB specific stuff looks fine. Um, now Hans can look at it and focus on whether USB Lee it's correct or not, if, if that makes any sense. Um, and you know, we don't really have those tools available to us today. So it's very um, labor intensive or catch as catch can ad hoc, you know, hey Hans, here's, you know, I'll send him a message. Hey Hans, here's this review. Can you look at it? Um, but you know, maybe he gets it, maybe he doesn't, um, you know, maybe, there's something wrong with my email or his and that message doesn't get through um, and having it all in a central tool, it's just there and you, and you can um, make it uh, work for people better. So um, we're, that's one of the things we're hoping to enable is just m more frictionless submissions of changes to the project. Yeah, I think there's um, a couple of things I wanted to add on to that. Um, that uh, one of the benefits I think of, of this, um, and it was sort of brought up in one of the questions, um, is that we will be able to carry the original author information through um, to a commit. So if you if you um, uh, get format patch and, and send it to a FreeBSD developer who brings it in, um, the, the commit can retain the original author um, all the way through, um, which is something Subversion just doesn't really have a concept of and so uh, you know and CDS didn't didn't either we we have the submitted by tag that, that we add into the commit but uh, but it is it is nice that we'll be able to keep the commit author um, in the native uh, native metadata of the, the, the version control tool um, reporting the original name uh, and there was also um, a comment about um, pull requests and GitHub issues and such. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate again, uh, the earlier comment that with the phase one transition, um, you know, none of, none of the workflow um, and tools um, other than VCS itself that we use are changing. So we, uh, you know, bugs are still in Bugzilla. Um, uh, we still have Fabricator. We can um, review uh, changes that are in um, Git in Fabricator um, just as well as in Subversion. Uh, so no, none of those are going to change. Uh, 
with with the the phase one transition uh and you know before um if any of them do change in the future it will be after uh, uh, uh evaluating and and uh, trials and prototypes and such, and and you know, with a, a reasoned um, decision to to do so. Um, yeah. So you know, just because we're not changing today doesn't close the door forever, and it, we're trying to. You know, there's there, there's a lot of um, anxiety around any change, and so we're trying to make this as easy on our current developer community. We don't want to alienate them by doing an abrupt change or a change that they can't then continue to do their submissions with. So, um, you know, one, one step at a time, you're absolutely right. Those things could replace, um, you know, the FreeBSD fabricator and Bugzilla instances and might be lower friction, but there are also a number of other uh, competitor tools out there as well that um, might be a better fit to the project um, or might not. One of the problems with GitHub is if you tie yourself too closely to GitHub, you um, run the risk of being deplatformed if there's something in your source that somebody else makes a complaint about. Um, so that's another thing that we need to be mindful about. Mirroring to GitHub, if we lose the GitHub mirror right now, who cares? Um, you know, people can redirect to a different Git repository. I mean, it, it would be a big deal. It would be very disruptive to a lot of people. I don't mean to make too light of it, but as a project basis, we continue as a project. We're not tied to, um, you know, their goodwill um, as our source of truth. Um, and so we need to be very careful and mindful of the dependencies that we introduce in the project and make sure that any of the ones that we do um, you know, we have a contingency plan if we get deplatformed, or we have um, a backup if we need it, so that we're not left high and dry. Um, and you know, talking through all those issues requires a little bit of thought and a little bit of care. And we didn't want um, that process to get in the way of getting converted to Git. So, um, and not to prejudice the outcome one way or the other. I'm you know trying to be fair to both sides, you know, there is some advantage to just using GitHub because somebody else is administering it, somebody else is dealing with it, it's somebody else's computer. Um, so, you know, the project wouldn't have to administer it. So there are some potential benefits from that, um, as well as the the risks and the downsides. And, and we haven't had a good chance to have a thoughtful discussion about that. And we don't want to have a, a quick discussion or make a quick decision that leads to a knee jerk flame war that sets the cause back six months or a year. So. That's another reason we're being a little conservative here is, you know, we know that this project uh, isn't as completely functional at times as we'd like. Um, and we are catering to that a little bit, but also trying to um, set up a better framework so that functional behavior is rewarded more than dysfunctional behavior in the future. So. Um, that's a hope for the project, and that might be uh, too big a change to pin on Git. But um, you know, it is, you know, it, it's part of the thinking that goes into this, and part of the reason we're trying to do it uh, in a slow, deliberative process is also to model good behavior for people, um, and to to make sure that a lot of the views can be considered at the, the appropriate time. So. So we're we're nearly out of time. Um, there are a couple of, of uh, questions here that we can probably get through um, fairly quickly. Uh, okay, why don't uh, you read through those? I see them. I think either one of us yeah. can answer that. W will the commit hashes change before now in the official switch between um, uh, at the end of December, um, and specifically for the source tree? Uh, I think the short answer is they should not. Um, if there is some sort of catastrophic um, issue that has not been uh, discovered yet. Um, there is a small chance that they would, but um, we believe they won't. And I suppose we can um, we can make that commitment shortly um, and say, you know, we can send an email at, at the appropriate time and say, yeah, well, we'll be sending an email in a week or two. Um, yeah, probably sometime next week. Yeah, um, uh, announcing the source conversion, and when we do that, the the hashes will be frozen, and we'll be stuck with whatever issues are there. Um, they're probably frozen now as a practical yeah. matter. Um, yeah. There's a number of things that 
uh, people notice and that still break when they change. And so I think they've uh, stopped changing. We've stopped accepting changes to author name. And the only thing that would cause a problem is if uh, someone were to make uh, a big mistake on a vendor import. That's the only area of exposure that uh, uh, Oli um, uh, Ux at FreeBSD.org, who did the conversion, has said that um, you know would be a problem um, if the core team just makes sure that any new committers in the, a particular file in the right place. Which, since Ed and I are both on there, we'll make sure of that. So. Um, I think we can commit to no hashes changing. What's what's the next question, Ed? Next question is, will the subdomain change from cgit beta to something else, e.g. git? Um, answer is, yes, it will. Uh, and the details are all uh, in the um, announcement, Warner, that you've sent out uh, already um, right. to, to the list. And, and uh, some of those details need to get merged into the documentation. I've been writing the documentation continuously for the last several months. And these details have changed as we've gotten experienced in a moving things to production. So all the documentation in advance of the cutover will be complete and we'll change it when we change the names. Yeah, and the final question was, um, can we make read-only and non-SSH um, access to the repository available? And yes, that is the intent. Um, I'm not sure if it's set up uh, or not just yet, but um, it definitely will be. Yeah, I think Lee Wynn was setting it up. I don't know if he has completed that yet or not, but it's certainly um, it's certainly something on the list, and it's certainly something that would help enable GOT, um, because that's one of the only ways you can clone is via SSH. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we have uh, been talking for about an hour, so uh, that's um, uh, that's all for this office hours. Uh, we will do a couple of these, a couple more of these, um, and in particular, um, we're going to have uh, continue to do this. Uh, as the transition happens, um, as each of the repositories transition, um, so that we can, um, we'll, we'll, we'll make them a little bit more interactive, probably. It will be less a presentation and discussion and more of a, you know, if, if you're trying to do something um, and running into a, to, to a problem, we'll uh, work on trying to solve the specific issue that you're, you're looking into. Right, plus if, if you look at the FreeBSD announce issues, or email that I sent, we're monitoring a number of different Discord and um, IRC channels um, for people that have problems so that they can drop in and we can help them out, um, which would also be useful for us in you know, seeing which areas of the documentation are still rough or what areas we need to document better. We've, we've done our best to try to cover all the bases, but you know, we're both engineers that have been in this game a long time and know that you know, there's some blind spot that we're just not seeing, and, and we'd like your help to make things better. So, so do drop into those and um, drop into the future ones. Are we going to do um, different times so that people in Asia can um, participate in the future? Yeah, we'll try and distribute these around um, at uh, at times, uh, a couple of different times, so it's convenient for for different time zones. All righty. And um, you know, reach out to Ed or I online if you have any questions. I guess I guess I shouldn't speak for Ed. <laughs> no, reach out to us. Yeah. So, thanks. All right. Thanks for taking the time to join us.